Hello, hello. Is everybody good? Are you guys comfortable? I hope everyone is comfortable. It's very important to me. Because we are in a crisis. So it's good to keep your cool. 20% of the people in America are illiterate. 70% of Americans read below a sixth grade level. So I'm not saying you shouldn't be comfortable. I'm saying that's a, a major problem, especially to um, see a couple of cardigans in the crowd, so I know my physically conservative people out here. These, <laughs> the literacy rate is costing the country $2.2 trillion a year. You know, so if you want to talk about abolishing student debt, that's a place to start. I was not always a reader. I wasn't a person who loved words. I wasn't a person who loved books. I wasn't a, a, a bibliophile. I was actually a very violent person. I used to handle conflict kind of like Will Smith at the Oscars. <laughs> Is it too soon? <laughs> Is it too soon? <laughs> Are we still healing? <laughs> I, was a pretty, I was a pretty rough guy, and books, books changed that. Books, they changed my life. They changed the way I saw the world, the way I saw myself, what I thought of myself. And I think we can do the same thing for other people. Because again, that crisis is leading to us not being able to think critically as a people and we see the results of what happen, what happens when whole nations aren't thinking critically. Some wild and crazy things happen. My journey in books and literature started with a hospital visit. Now bear with me, you know, not trying to look hyper-masculine or tough or anything like that, but I was like a semi-reformed gangster, right? I was like semi-tough. Um, semi because I was trying to change my life, right? But I didn't know what direction I wanted to go in. What do you do when you stop, when you stop hustling in the streets and you wanna, you wanna have a stake in society and you wanna live a productive life? What do you do? What do you do? What is the transition? Because I never thought about that part. Coming out of the streets, and having a career, what's, you know, there's, there's no like, there's no like um, mentorship program from, like selling crack to like selling automobiles. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't exist, right? So because of my semi, my semi gangster ways, I was in a hospital, um, Johns Hopkins Hospital, not, not, a, not a plug. Um, <laughs> and I was having a procedure done and the nurse changed my life. She didn't know she was changing my life. I didn't know she was changing my life, but she changed my life. So I'm in bed and I'm watching this show, right? It's called Mama's Family. I don't know, you guys are young, you probably never heard of it, but it's about a mama and her family. And it came on like a hundred times a day <laughs> to the point where like I could memorize the lines. I really wanted to get out of the hospital, but I met this nurse and she came into my room and she had a book stuck to her face. And I never in my life saw a person reading like that. At this point, I thought I hated reading. Everyone loves Curious George and, you know, uh, Stone Soup and books like that when you're kids, at least where I came from. But by the time we got to middle school, it was all Mark Twain. The only story you're given to a whole bunch of black kids in a city like Baltimore, the only representation we were getting was the slave who would chase around Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer while they painted gates. And when you see something in a book, it's, it's normally considered to be the um, definitive authority, right? It's, it's, it's fact. This is your place. You don't really have a place outside of being in a subservient position. Books set the standards on beauty and culture across the board. So it's very important that, that, that we put a pin in that because that was my experience as a man in his late 20s sitting in a hospital in awe that a nurse that was around my age, black and from Baltimore like me, was stuck, had her head stuck in a book. I've never seen anything like that in my life. 
So I said, wow, that must be a good book. What are you reading? She said, oh, you would love this book. She doesn't know me. Does she like me? <laughs> she should. <laughs> Why would I love that book? Oh, because this book is about you. This is a book about thugs. <laughs> Mind you, I'm semi-reformed at this point. Thugs? I'm not a thug. Oh, you're not a thug? No, I'm not a thug. Well, how come you got those basement tattoos? And you know, I'm covering my tattoos. How come every person who comes to visit you smells like a whole bunch of weed? And I said, duh, they got cataracts. <laughs> so she said, whatever. And we laughed and joked because I've been in a hospital for a while and I've, I've saw this young woman before, but I never really paid attention to her until I saw her with that book stuck to her face. So she, you know, she leaves and um, I continue to watch this show, Mama's Family, I told you about that. And I fell asleep when I woke up. The book was sitting next to me, right? So I picked it up and started thumbing through pages. And the book was called The Coldest Winter Ever. It was a story about a young woman learning to navigate um, New York coming from a drug family, right? Coming from a situation that was similar to what I was coming from. And it blew my mind. I never thought a story that was anything close to mine could actually make it into a book. I was hooked. <laughs> At the time, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't as much of a reader as I am now. Obviously, I'm an egghead now. You can see my head and glasses. But this particular time, there was no glasses. <laughs> and there was no egghead. You know? And it would take me a couple of days to finish a book that was 300 pages. Um, and this is something, and, and after reading all day, right? After reading all day, like no breaks, because I was hooked. I couldn't believe you could tell a story like that. And um, I ended up being discharged from the hospital, and I, and I never saw that, that nurse again. But I, I kept that book, and I read it again. And then I've read any and everything Sister Soldier ever wrote. And then I started hanging out around bookshops around Baltimore, and people were saying, oh, well, you like that book. You, you got to read Claude McKay. Makes me want to holler. Oh, okay, let me check that out. Oh, okay, he was inspired by James Baldwin and Toni Morrison. And let me pick up Beloved. Let me pick up Bill Street. Uh, wow. Oh, wow, so these guys, the beat poets, they were writing around the same time. But, oh, my God, Naked Lunch on the Road. How can you, you write a sentence? That's a whole page. And now I'm hooked. <laughs> You know, I went from reading a book that was close to my experience to sitting on Ashland Avenue and reading The Gambler by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Gone. All I wanted to do was read. All I wanted to do was think. All I wanted to do was to be around words, and my life was changing. When I went into the hospital, I was a person who was being taxed. I don't know if you guys ever heard the term ignorance tax, but it's when you have to pay extra because you just don't know, because you're not thinking critically. These are the car loan places that surround my neighborhood where they send you a, a, a five-year-old Mercedes for $350,000 <laughs> by, by the time you finish paying for it, it costs more than a brand new one. The payday loan places that are waiting for the women who, and the men who work in dietary in the kitchen at Hopkins to, who can't make it till payday and they walk down Miami Street and they get that little advance to help get them through the week and they never get out of their debt. How we allow ourselves or how we are allowed to be treated or what we go through in the system based on the inability to know how it, how it fully functions and what it's supposed to do with us, and that's across the board, not just talking about one system. I was being taxed, my family was being taxed, everybody around me was being taxed every day because we didn't think critically, so we had to pay for that. And I was changing, and I continued to change, and I continued to read, and I continued to study, and I continued to do more, and <laughs> I went to college, and then I went to graduate school, and I'd read any and everything I could get my hands on, uh, <laughs> from the Baltimore Sun and city paper, to self-help books, to those goofy publishing for dummies books, which, <laughs> because you see where I'm going with this, right? 
I felt like I was growing, and every time I touched a book, I got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and I wanted it to be my life. And I, I, I started uh, submitting essays to all of these different publications, and after I submitted about two million, one even published me, right? <laughs> right? Uh, I even got like an $18 check. <laughs> this is like coming out of the street, so I, you know, I can... My first check is $18, I can, you know, it's good. Um, because I earned it. And from there, other places hired me and, and they, wanted, they wanted me to write and I got a chance to, um, you know, I started publishing at salon.com and then that turned into the New York Times and Rolling Stone and New York Times Magazine and then I started getting book deals and all of these amazing things started happening for me and at the time, different publications around the city started telling my story. Baltimore Sun did a cover story and they put me on the front page of the art section. And at this point in my life, I feel like I made it. Everybody from my neighborhood who knew me and they knew, you know, what I've been through, um, especially their moms and grandmoms, they would, you know, they, and I don't know if people still do this, but they were laminating my, my news article and they were hanging it on a, on a wall. I would see, I would see myself, you know, I'm sitting in the house rolling a blunt and I'm looking at a shiny plastic picture of me on top of, you know, grandma's mantle. So I'm like, yo, I really made it. I really did something. And I didn't do a thing, and I'll tell you why. So one day, after one of these, uh, these, uh, you know, coming off of, um, you know, like a little speaking gig or something like that. I got a chance to come home on the weekend and chill. And it's a, it's a, it's a Sunday. And at Bocek Park on Sundays, we used to, you know, have games in the morning. And like, so the old guys like me, we would get there at 7 o'clock in the morning. And we would be off the court by 9 a.m. because the young guys start to wake up. And when they come, you know, we like to judge them and talk about them, but we don't want to get on the court with them because they're young. They can jump. They can dunk. They have abs and stuff that I haven't seen in a long time. <laughs> so I'm finishing my, my, my one, you know, my first game, and I'm walking to the sideline because, you know, we play music and we play cards and we grill food and play dominoes and, and stuff like that, too. You know, it used to be like a thing. So I'm, I'm wa walking over to get, some, um, to get some food out the grill and to get a bottle of water, and there's this dude from, from my hustling days named Dub on the other side of the gate. And Doug is was like the biggest guy. Dub is like, was like the biggest guy from the neighborhood. Like, if you can think of like, um, think of a Cadillac Escalade with a sweater on, right? And like boot cut jeans is how big he is. He's a big guy. He's a big guy. He has to walk through doors like sideways. He's a, he's a big guy. And he's like, D, I need to talk to you. So I was like, okay, man, one second, I'll be over. He said, come on, man, I, I need to talk to you. And Dub, you know, used to be what you call an enforcer back in the day. So if somebody will owe a person like myself money and I wasn't trying to go get the money back, you send Dub. And Dub will go find that person. He'll pick him up. And he'll shake the money out of him. <laughs> and then he'll bring it back to you and he'll take a cut. And he ended up, um, he ended up um, hurting somebody really bad. And he did, like, he did like 10 years in prison. But he came home. He got his life together. Um, he got a job working for the city, and then like another job, like he can like demo houses with like his hands. It's like wow, like you ever see a person like gut a house with like their hands? It's like, <laughs> cause I can't, I don't do home improvement stuff. So all of this stuff is fat. Anything is fascinating to me. Like you know, putting together IKEA IKEA dresses. God, oh my God, how'd you get those two thousand pieces to make one dresser? Right, like that guy. So I walk out and um. We take a little walk down the street, and now we're away from the basketball court. And he's telling me congratulations on a success. He's telling me his grandma and his mom, they both have my little article laminated, hanging up in the living room, and he's like, F you, because it's over top of my picture. And I'm like, respectfully, dub, dub I'm doing a little bit more. And you know, <laughs> and we laughing, we were laughing, we are having a good time. And he digs in his pocket, and he passes me a letter. So he says, read that. So I said, cool. So I'm looking at the letter and I'm reading it. And it's a letter from his daughter. And she's talking about how, you know, how great he is and how she's so proud of him for turning his life around. And it was really, really personal. So I stopped in the middle and I'm like, why would I want to read a letter from your daughter to you? Like, it feels like I'm crossing the line. He said, no, read it out loud. Then it hit me. My friend, 
who turned his life around, who was praising me for the, for the things that I was able to accomplish, can't read. He's proud of the story that's laminated in his mom's and his grandmom's house, but that's not my, it's not my work. It's somebody writing about me. <laughs> it's not me. So I'm writing this stuff about where we come from and what we've been through or how I see the world and the people who I want to benefit the most isn't getting anything from it. So I said, you know what? I'm not gonna read this letter, but guess what? I will teach you how to read. So he's like, man, read the letter. And like I said, he's bigger than everybody I know. So I just thought, well, hey, I love you, daddy. You know, <laughs> I got to the end, I got to the end of the letter, right? I read it for him. And then I, you know, I, I passed it to him, he took it, and he starts to walk off. He's in tears, big fellas in tears. And you know, I was, I'm not what you would call the most emotional person in the world, but I was kind of like choked up too. Like I, I felt like something about to fall out of my eye, but it didn't. Um, but I said, I said, yo, we don't have to tell anybody. If you want me to teach you, I'll teach you. And he works for the city and he works with his hands. And his job, reading for what he did, what, what he does for a living, reading, it wasn't a requirement. So he was able to exist in that way. And it, it hurt me, it shook me, you know, it, 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 it cut bone deep because I wanted my brother to be able to benefit and be transformed just like I was. I wanted more for him like I, like I wanted more for myself. And you think you're getting all of this praise from these people outside of your neighborhood and where you come from, but these are the people who should be your first priority. And it caused me to reshift my whole career. I no longer wanted to be the person from the inside writing to people out. I wanted to focus on my neighborhood and making sure the people who come from where I come from are able to fall in love with books just like me. And that led to me, um, I'm on my fifth book now, um, tens of thousands of copies um, from publishing companies, from Penn Faulkner Foundation, from Hook's books, from my own money, have been given, um, donated to students all over this country. I've made hundreds of visits, I've taught hundreds of workshops, and many times I'm the only person, the only author that a lot of young people have ever met, and I'm, I'm committed and dedicated to doing that for the rest of my life. I believe that if I can use the platform I have, the power I have, and the resources I have, we can put a dent in the problem. Now, if you guys <laughs> and the people you know were committed to not just reading, but sharing how transformative books can be with other people, then we can put an even bigger dent in the problem that's plaguing our country. Um, I'm gonna keep working at it. I never got a chance to teach my friend Dub how to read, but I got a chance to spark the career of a whole lot of writers and to help a whole lot of young people fall in love with books, and I'll be forever thankful for that. Thank you.